Jim Simons versus Warren Buffett, who really won? That's quite the headline, isn't it? It sounds like a boxing poster. Simons versus Buffett, the quant versus the oracle, the rumble in the market. I don't quite see it that way. And I'm certainly not here to declare victory over Warren Buffett. He's a legend, one of the greatest investors of all time. What he's built at Berkshire Hathaway over half a century is astonishing. Enduring, transparent, and disciplined. But the title does raise a good question. Not who won, but what won. It's not about personalities, it's about philosophies. Two different ways of seeing reality. Two different religions, if you will. There's the Church of Buffett, the Faith of Fundamentals. It's a warm human religion. It has its high priest in Omaha and thousands of devoted followers who make their pilgrimage every year. Its scripture is the annual report. Its commandments are simple. Know what you own. Be fearful when others are greedy. Invest in what you understand. You study the business. You meet management. You judge the moat, the cash flow, the character. You look for a story you believe in. Peter Lynch, another saint of that tradition, once bought Haynes stock because his wife liked legs, pantyhose at the supermarket. A perfect story. Common sense, connection, intuition. You buy what you know. You hold for decades. Then there's our church colder, stranger, more mechanical. A faith not in stories, but in statistics. Not in gut, but in algorithms. Not in understanding the business, but in not needing to. My background wasn't in finance. I never took a finance class. I was a mathematician, a code breaker. In my 20s, at the Institute for Defense Analyses, I worked on encrypted Soviet communications, pure chaos. Our job was to find structure where none seemed to exist. We didn't invent stories about the messages. We built mathematical models to detect hidden patterns. When I looked at markets, I saw the same thing. Not companies, not CEOs, just data a vast stream of numbers. And I believe, still believe, that in any mountain of data, there is structure if you search correctly. So a quant fund, to me, was simply an idea factory. It treated markets as a laboratory. Somewhere in that chaos were small, non-random trading effects patterns invisible to the naked eye. We didn't need the why. We needed the pattern proven statistically, executed automatically, free of emotion. Buffett versus Simons is really story versus statistic. Intuition versus algorithm. Human versus machine. And before I could prove that the machine worked, I had to spend a decade proving that my own intuition didn't. I left academia in 1978, age 40, restless and curious. I'd built a math department, won a prize, but I wanted a new puzzle. So I opened a firm called Monometrics in a strip mall next to a pizza place. Not exactly Wall Street glamour. And I began trading by gut, like a little Buffett wannabe, minus the wisdom. My first taste had come years earlier. I took a wedding gift, bought stocks, got bored, and followed my broker into soybeans. Made a quick profit, felt brilliant, held too long, lost it all. The market humbled me. That pattern would repeat. When I started Monometrics, I called an old colleague, Lenny Baum, co-inventor of the Baum-Welch algorithm, one of the building blocks of machine learning, a mathematical killer, zero interest in finance. I showed him currency charts. See, I said, it's not random. He was hooked. Our first big trade, 1979. Lenny predicted the British pound would soar under Margaret Thatcher. He was right. We made millions. We added another genius, James Axe. Three mathematicians conquering markets. Easy. Of course, we weren't geniuses. We were lucky and arrogant. We built no system, just told ourselves a smarter story. Lenny's optimism was boundless. His strategy, buy low and hold forever. It sounded a lot like Buffett, except without Buffett's understanding of what we owned. In 1980, gold went wild. $250 to $700. I saw people lined up at jewelry shops selling rings and fillings. Obvious bubble. I begged Lenny to sell. He refused. The trend will continue. I finally grabbed the phone and screamed, Sell the gold, Lenny! 
we did just before the crash. My panic beat is optimism, hardly a system, just one human gut overpowering another. Eventually, his stubbornness sank us. By 1984, long bonds, wrong direction, refused to sell, the fund imploded, my first partner gone. Then came Axe. Brilliant, volatile, unpredictable. We formed Axcom. We had a secret weapon, Sandor Strauss, our data saint. He gathered everything, decades of market data, hand-copied Fed rates, ancient tapes, clean, consistent, precious. But Axe went off the rails, moved to Malibu, traded by reading the New York Times after midnight. Literal news trading. The models gathered dust. By 1989, we were down 30%. Two partnerships gone, 10 years of failure. Buffett, meanwhile, was compounding calmly in Omaha, proving that patience and fundamentals worked. I had proven the opposite, that my own gut, and even the genius of others, was noise. I told a friend, it's too hard to do it this way. I have to do it mathematically. I had to build a machine. The anti-Buffett, year 1989, I was 51, nearly out of money and patience, time to start over. If Buffett's motto was, know what you own, ours became, know nothing but the numbers. Enter Elwin Burlikamp, a game theorist. He looked at our long-term trend models and said, that's your problem. Each bet is too big. You're gambling on stories that last months, trade shorter. He was right. A casino doesn't need to win every hand, just more than half. With enough small bets, a 51% edge compounds to greatness. That insight changed everything. We stopped chasing whales and started netting guppies, thousands of tiny short-term patterns. Henry Lawfer, Elwin, Sandor, and I rebuilt from the ground up. We used Sandor's pristine data down to five-minute intervals and search for micro patterns, the weekend effect, the 24-hour effect, strange currency correlations, and we stopped asking why. That was our heresy and our liberation. Buffett thrives on the why. Management, quality, moats, products. We let go of that entirely. If the pattern was statistically real, it stayed, even if it made no sense. We called these anomalies ghosts. They were faint, but reliable. And as I like to say, I don't know why planets orbit the sun, but I can still predict where they'll be. In 1990, the system went live. Medallion Fund gained 55.9% after fees. It worked, but we wanted more. Futures were humming, stocks were a mess, Buffett's home turf. Our models failed to make money there. Then we found two unlikely saviors. IBM was downsizing its speech recognition team scientists who'd been teaching computers to understand language. My colleague, Nick Patterson, said, they're brilliant and probably miserable. Perfect. So, in 1993, we hired Peter Brown and Robert Mercer. They were linguists, not financiers. But their world, hidden Markov models, statistical translation, was the same math we'd been using all along. They looked at markets and saw language. Not balance sheets, but grammar. The probability that after Apple comes pi, or after a 2 p.m. spike comes a 2-5 dip. They built a single, adaptive brain, a machine learning system that absorbed everything. Price data, analyst forecasts, earnings, even weather. There's no data like more data, Mercer liked to say. It wasn't looking for obvious trends. It was modeling multidimensional relationships, correlations among thousands of variables no human could parse. Buffett knew what he owned. We knew how it moved. He held for decades. We held for minutes. He made a few brilliant concentrated bets. We made hundreds of thousands of tiny ones, each with a microscopic edge. At first, it didn't work. Two years of frustration. I gave them six months or I'd shut it down. Then a 26-year-old programmer, David Magerman, founded a single line of bad code, a hard-coded S&P value from 1991 that broke every risk calculation. He fixed it. The machine roared to life. Profits exploded. 
From 1988 to 2018, Medallion averaged 39.1% annual returns after fees, 66% gross. Berkshire Hathaway, 20.5%. Soros, 32. Peter Lynch, 29. Numerically, sure, our system won. But it wasn't about beating Buffett. We weren't playing his game. We'd invented a new one. If you define winning by numbers, Yes, the machine triumphed, but Buffett's victory was human and enduring. He built Berkshire Hathaway real companies, real jobs, real products. He created a philosophy millions could follow, save, invest, think long term. He became a moral compass for capitalism. We built a black box, a beautiful one, but private. We capped Medallion in 1993 because our short-term signals couldn't scale. We eventually removed all outside investors. Only employees could stay in. The result? A few dozen very wealthy scientists. Effective, yes. Democratic, no. Buffett won the 20th century. But who won the future? Look at today's market. Buffett's edge, access to information, disciplined valuation has eroded. Regulation equalized disclosure. The internet made every annual report universal. Everyone knows the same story. And when everyone knows the same story, the story stops working. Now, data dominates. Algorithms move prices. Machines trade with other machines. Quants control roughly 30% of equities volume. JP Morgan trains its bankers to code. The market itself has become a system of systems. Our system scaled to the world. The ghosts have taken over, and yet even I am still human. In 2007, during the quant quake, all the machines stumbled. Correlations went haywire. We lost a billion dollars in a week. My team said, trust the model. I didn't. I panicked. I overrode the system, the very thing I'd built to prevent that instinct. We sold. Days later, the market snapped back. Had we done nothing, we'd have made it all back and more. Even I couldn't fully escape the human flaw I'd spent decades trying to engineer away. So, who won? Buffett perfected human judgment, the art of patience, simplicity, and faith in people. We perfected the opposite, a process that minimized judgment altogether. A machine that found statistical edges too small for humans to see and exploited them relentlessly. He proved the power of understanding. We proved the power of abstraction. He won hearts, we won equations. If you measure legacy by wealth created for the world, Buffett wins. If you measure by predictive power, by the evolution of markets, the machine wins. But the deeper truth is that both approaches, the human and the mathematical, were inevitable stages in the same story. Buffett wrote the final chapter of the human era of investing. We wrote the first chapter of the algorithmic one. The Church of Buffett will always exist because people need stories. The Church of Simons will grow because the world runs on data. And between the two, the market, as always, will find its own balance.